Embedding a meaningful and supported culture of volunteering in your organisation is a challenge that many volunteer managers face. And volunteer managers across many sectors are advocating to keep their positions and programs funded. If anything, this is likely to be exacerbated by COVID-19 into 2021. So to kick off our webinars for 2021, I am talking to two volunteer program managers and advocates, Penny Aquino and Lyra Woodman, um, to hear about uh, their story and their perspective on uh, how to embed a meaningful and supported culture of volunteering and fly the flag. So welcome to Volunteering Victoria's webinar series. Uh, before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land where I am today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I recognise that we may have participants from different parts of the country with different traditional owners. So I'd encourage you to um, uh, acknowledge the traditional owners where you are in the chat if you would like. So just a few housekeeping notes before I introduce our two guests. In the interest of all other listeners, you should have arrived on mute um, and please keep yourself on mute throughout the course of the webinar. There's a public chat box where you can send messages or hellos to other participants and please use that or the Q&A box to send questions for our two panellists uh, for us to answer at the end of the webinar. At the end of the webinar, uh, this recording will be put up on Volunteering Victoria's website um, and should be available within a couple of days. So without further ado, let me introduce my two guests, Lyra and Penny. Um, so Penny has had over 30 years of management and leadership experience in several sectors, including education, training, hospitality, and not-for-profit, including particularly in volunteer management. She's currently undertaking a master's in leadership and management of organizational dynamics and has a bachelor of arts, a diploma in hospitality management, training, change management, uh, qualifications and awarded opportunities to further develop leadership capabilities through several executive leadership programs. Welcome Penny. So Lyra Woodman has joined us, uh, joined Ben Dego Tape and Kangan Institute in 2019. With a degree in strategic communication, she has 24 years experience in the public sector across health, careers, education, and human services. Uh, she's been involved in volunteer management from the philanthropic and social enterprise perspectives and personally volunteers to promote, empower, and increase participation for women in sport. So welcome, Lyra and Penny. It's so lovely having you presenting today. Thanks, Sarah. Good to be here. All right, so as we do start off all of our webinars, we are going to ask you to um, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself and your role. So Penny, I'll get you to go first. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm the General Manager at the Salvation Army for Volunteer Resources, and I started eight years ago with a box literally given to me and, um, and from that point did uh, lots of advocacy. Um, my focus as, as a GM is to lead a national team and particularly to focus on building the capabilities of managers of volunteers in safe and effective volunteer involvement. And, uh, and our managers of volunteers either identify themselves as that, as that and are many that don't um, identify themselves as that. So it's a bit of a job to, to bring about change um, in the Salvation Army. Um, I am a mother of a newly graduated year 12 student, yay, who now drives, and I have a two-year-old Schnauzer and been married for 20 years, so it's just something about me personally. Um, you can see on the slide there, the Salvation Army, the reach that the organisation has. It's a lot bigger than what I realised when I first started, and um, all those um, points there that are listed uh, involve the, have involvement of volunteers um, from huge numbers to smaller numbers, depending on the expression. Yeah, it's a, a fantastic range of programs that the Salvos provides for sure. So Lyra, do you want to tell us just a little bit about yourself and uh, your role? Uh, yes, yeah. so um, I work for uh, regional and metro TAFE, so Benigo TAFE and then Kangan Institute um, cross about, span across about 10 campuses. Um, I run three volunteer programs, so for student volunteers, community volunteers and volunteer mentors. Um, I have like annual 
uh, project funding. So I'm always trying to get some runs on the board every single year, hoping that I get funding the following year. So um, it probably matches my energy level and frenetic pace, but uh, uh, certainly, um, yeah, it's been a challenge during COVID to do that. Um, my background really, um, it's not that glamorous. Um, I started in business admin. I just had a quiet kind of suburban existence. And like most mums, I just take jobs that prioritise the family. So, you know, part-time or whatever. Um, and I, I joined a, a philanthropic health foundation. So I was involved in like charity events, donor campaigns, like campaigning in regional and rural areas. I'd animated like ambassador mascots and started a not-for-profit uh, gift shop with my manager. And yeah, she was really, really creative. So that was, that was an awesome experience. And then for some reason, I crazily decided on the birth of my second child to start me bachelor's. Um, and so along with my husband, we both studied for about 10 years and we've only just finished out the other side of that. And I actually owe it to him as to why I undertook this volunteer management job. He, he's known me for 25 years and said, I think that really, really suits you. You should go for it. So here I am. And yeah, I've just been excited so far with them. Um, uh, what I've learned about the sector and, and, and certainly its challenges as well. It's, it's really been nice to have that peer support. Absolutely. And so that leads us in very nicely to my Every Hero Needs an Origin story. Um, because even though I do think volunteers are the true heroes in all of this, I also do think volunteer managers often pull out some Herculean efforts. And because of the diversity that exists in our sector, I think it's really, really important for people to understand different pathways. So you've given us a little bit of a sense of your pathway, Lyra. Penny, did you want to add, talk about how you managed to, you know, whoopsie into volunteer management, <laughs> as I think the technical term is? Yeah, that was certainly, it certainly been my story, the whoopsie into volunteer management. I, I had no idea. I mean, I, I knew when I finished school that I wanted to do hospitality management, um, I was really very um, focused and committed and excited and passionate around, around the whole area of hospitality and worked in so many different expressions of that for quite a long time. And then due to just sick of working 60, 70 hours a week, I went and my body was saying no more. I moved into training and from there, um, which I loved. So I used to train people on hospitality skills and train the trainer and all sorts of things. And then I went, did my whoopsie into further education, but like Lyra and did a BA um, at that point. And in the midst of being at college, started a program at the college that I was for year 13. Um, so, you know, it's hospitality, then education and training. And then when I was um, wanting to return to work after having our daughter, um, a friend put a PD in front of me, a position description for the world, uh, for um, World Vision, and it was a role that I thought, surely not, I'm not qualified, and it was a volunteer, national volunteer coordinator. Um, but the sort of skill sets did sort of stick because I was doing lots of volunteer management in, in the faith community that I was in, and I guess I had the spirit of service um, given to me by my dad, um, and so. It, kind of did excite me and, and strangely I got the role um, and was there for a couple of years and then moved on to RSPCA and then the Salvation Army. So it was never in the plan. Um, <laughs> and every now and then when I hit a blooming hard patch, which each of those organisations have had, I go, I've got to get out of this space and yet I keep, I keep, keep, keep on, keeping on. Um, so the whoopsies has continued. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a very technical term, but I, I do think, um, you know, one of the, the richest aspects of the sector is that everybody be, brings bits of their career pathway to volunteer management. Um, and so I think it's important to share. So, you know, when we started talking about this webinar, we were talking about both, uh, you know, kind of program advocacy, um, you know, from a funding, you know, scope perspective, but also embedding that culture of appreciation and, I guess, um, you know, meaningful volunteering in an organisation. And, you know, to start with a little bit of the, the basics, I guess I'll ask you, um, I guess, why do we feel, um, uh, why do volunteer managers often end up being program advocates? And I'll start with you again, Penny. Um, I, I think because we just see the gap. Um, we see the opportunity. We, we see the gap of what's not currently that should be, that makes sense to be, that's the right thing. And, um, and, and so where there's a gap, 
and, and particularly if there's um, in a gap because, and it seems to be unjust or, you know, illogical or just playing dumb when it comes to the organisation's mission, it's pretty hard not to speak up and advocate because you just see the possibilities of what isn't. Um, and I think as a sector, um, this seems to be experience of many volunteer managers and Sarah, you'd know this most more than anyone, all the conversations do you have, uh, but certainly in the three organisations that I've been in, there's just been some immediate opportunities that I just think I can't stay silent, I need to speak up and, um, and bring about, you know, go about trying to make a change. Um, and, and there's lots of, um, you know, there's been some great, some great information coming from the likes of JB Weir when they had their support report and just the gap, gap of um, investment in this space is um, illogical. <laughs> I, sound, I sound like Star Trek, it's illogical. Um, <laughs> it, does, it does seem like it just doesn't quite add up. Um, and then the, the consequences of that lack of um, resourcing and what we could continue to build in the Australian community. Um, to, to better support our communities and the expression of people's care and concern for their local communities and their environment and animal welfare and so on. So I'll, I'll stop there because I'll, I'll keep on going. So Lyra, over to you. <laughs> oh, thanks, Penny. Um, I like what you've said about seeing what isn't there um, and you know that feeling of, of wanting to say something. Um, I think um, definitely kind of in, in my study and career journey and where I'm at, um, maybe it's an age thing or maybe it is just a, a also experience, but sometimes you don't always have the, um, you're always too intellectually humble and think, oh, okay, I'm, I might not be the subject matter expert. Do I speak up? Do I speak out of turn? Will I still have a job at the end of it if I, if I don't, you know, and advocate for my program? So sometimes, yeah, I, it would be great to, to you know, not, not bite your tongue and feel like, um, that you can say something, but certainly, you know, feeling like you've got to be at the right table and give yourself permission to actually, you know, be strong in what you're saying and, and consolidate the, what you're trying to say uh, and say it clearly as well um, is something, you know, um, some of us are, are definitely, you know, trying to strive towards if you're not kind of um, maybe middle management and upper level. Um, and also, I suppose, um, on that point, you know, depending on where you are, you, your vantage point, you mightn't have a bird's eye view. So, you know, sometimes that viewpoint isn't attainable in your own organisation because sometimes we can become busy managing from the bottom up and focus on just trying to gain our program's awareness and acceptance. So like, like being dealing with your deliverables at an operational level and often that can kind of block out your strategic direction and align it to your overall plan. So it's really trying to, carve out that space to think uh, strategically and you know align and uh, ally yourselves with those people that are going to advocate for you instead of just you yourself mm -hmm. doing all the heavy lifting. Absolutely and so now that we've kind of you know to elaborate a little bit on determining that need or gap like for those who are starting or those who have just sort of walked into an organization and think Hmm. something doesn't feel totally right here how do you start like from both of your experience how did you start determining the need um, uh, for advocacy within your organization and sort of I guess what if this kind of differs from the view of leadership within your organization and Lyra if you wanted to take it away on this one Oh my gosh, I'll try not to sound like a tirade, I promise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is just totally my song that I keep seeing on heat. But, um, you know, so like, you know, if I go through who needs the advocacy, obviously I'm going to be a bit biased on this one. Uh, my programs and volunteers, of course. Um, so especially because um, they're not really um, embedded into the organisation. Um, so that annual funding, um, I'm always needing to evidence those outcomes quickly. Um, and before long, I'm already putting in my business case for the next year's program. So in some ways feeling like a sole operator within like that project-based project funding arrangement, it kind of means like I'm intrinsically a self-starting advocate for every volunteer-related activity that I'm involved with in the organisation. But really what I'm after is just embedding the value um, 
to the organisation of the culture of volunteerism and having that adopted um, and spoken as a dialect um, across the Institute. That would, that's really what um, I think would be a success metric of reaching um, that, that epitome of stopping my advocacy. Um, but when you do it, like timing's everything, you know, if you jump in at the right time of your planning cycles at different levels. So, you know, annually for me, I'm really always trying to angle in early enough before the end of annual year for my area or portfolios. Um, I'm always trying to be at projects at the forefront of like newer initiatives to kind of freshen my thinking and, and think organisationally and strategically. Um, and then at strategic planning level, obviously, uh, the direction that organisations going and make sure my activities are aligned because that obviously helps as well um, with the executive and board. But, you know, I really think it starts with us, you know, that, that top-down culture um, is where it's led. So, I'm, you know, for me, it's an executive sponsor or a director or middle management that can actively speak that volunteering dialect um, that I need to include in corporate and organisational meetings. So that's kind of my my thing for this year and, and seeing if I can really get that sponsorship um, secured. And we've got so many different alignments. I don't know what other people's organisations, but there's always restructures and things like that. So it's being across that and making sure you understand um, who those leads are and what their work styles are and then just keep adjusting accordingly so that uh, you can get accepted and represented uh, as opposed to self-advocating. Absolutely, Lyra. Penny, <laughs> we yeah, could probably Lyra. speak a whole hour just on this uh, question. I, I could, and I, you know, sort of, it's tricky, isn't it? Because you don't want to um, cover too much. But um, I really like Lyra's sort of perspective around the importance of understanding your stakeholders and, and looking for other advocates. I think that's really critical, particularly um, if you're a one person team or a couple of persons team and the reach of that's expected is bigger than what you're actually resourced to. And I think that's one of the signposts or the gaps is, you know, what is the resourcing that's been given to you versus your position description? Is there a disparity there? Um, and if it's, if, if there is a disparity, then it's actually, well, either change the PD um, or um, readjust um, the expectations by getting more resources so um, and sponsorship for both those situations obviously needed if you want to change it to PD which is always a bit dangerous because you don't want to threaten your own role but um, I, I certainly know when I started out the Salvation Army my PD was just ridiculously large like it was just insane I was Victoria and then I was um, had responsibility for other states as well and I was one one person and um so I, I just questioned, questioned the quality of that at that time. And um, the other thing is, uh, you know, to figure out where your role sits in the organisation against those expectations as well. When I started there, I sat under um, a fundraising event function and yet the volunteers were in um, predominant, well, there was, they were throughout the organisation. So the position where I was wasn't reflecting the actual position of volunteers. Um, so there's that other signposts for the need for advocacy. Um, and I guess a level of understanding of ways and of how many volunteers support the organisation. Is there reporting mechanisms to give you that picture? If there isn't, then the organisation doesn't actually understand that resource. And that's another area for advocacy. Um, but I liked Lyra's, um, when she said, you know, is the language inclusive um, of volunteers? And that's a real clear evidence around the culture. So if it's not included and that's not considered, and sometimes it's in, um, it can be in annual reports, but it's not in the everyday speak or in the resourcing or in the um, expectations and support for training of volunteers, then it's exclusive. So it's not inclusive of volunteers. So, you know, is it in written comms? Is it in the everyday speak? Um, and, and then the inclusion of volunteers in policy and procedures and systems and, and including things like access to information and employee assistance program for those um, organisations that have that support. All these are signposts to seeing, you know, where you need to do your advocacy and, and do, you know, gain, gain that sponsorship from others to make a change there. Um, and I know like at RSPCA when I first started there, volunteers were contributing just directly with animal care, 
but there were so many other opportunities that you know people that we interviewed would, were interested to explore but there was a real blockage around that and we just went about advocating for that change by working on stakeholders or you know, folk, folk within the org structure that were interested to try that and from there build outwards and then, then um, volunteers actually ended up, skilled volunteers ended up helping um, the, the organisation in, um, in ways that were outside direct animal care and it totally changed the, the nature of volunteer involvement and it gave the organisation um, the resources to do advocacy in a way that they hadn't. So it, it's, um, you know, finding out where the gaps are and then thinking about who do you can find to partner with you to make that change. Um, and if it's not your line manager, you know, who else could it be? Yeah, fantastic. Um, and so next, I mean, you know, talking about strategy, I guess, in a nutshell, so try and solve world peace for me. But um, <laughs> what strategies have you guys used uh, to be effective advocates and promoters of health? culture obviously knowing that like these are not one size fits all answers but have there been specific things like language or resources or just getting in the face of executives that have particularly helped you in promoting your cause and paying off road to you yeah sure um I think naivety when you start an organization is a really <laughs> good thing <laughs> Sometimes not knowing everything can make, make you more bold and then you learn the culture and then you, you know, change. So I have to say that uh, I went pretty um, bold at the Salvation Army only because I didn't fully understand the organisation and then I, then I became more, um, probably more subtle about how I went things. But in some ways that boldness really helped. What also helped was the Royal Commission into Childhood sexual offence and I'm, you know it's tragic to even be saying that that helped because that's just not a right sentence really um, but it did uh, provide the uh, um, I guess a visibility to the uh, leadership on the area of risk and involvement of all worker types and they hadn't really had that visibility awareness to the extent that they needed to to respond to the um, revelations that came and that you know that just obviously hurts my heart as it does many in this space so risks are a great um, leverage for change and, you know, bad news sells. Um, also, the other um, opportunities is le legislative compliance. Um, so that can help for um, investment. And if you're lucky to be in an environment where innovation is um, alive and well, then coming up with creative new ideas and finding people to do that with is um, obviously a really good strategy as well. Yes. But I just laid out what the problem was and how to resolve the problem and it worked. It didn't work quite in the way I expected. I went too big um, and they knocked it back and then I had to bring into um, place some phasing in of resources. But it meant that I wasn't a single person anymore and I ended up having some team members um, to help the build towards the, um, looking at the elephant that we had to um, chomp into to to bring about the change yeah yeah sometimes it really is about uncovering gradual pieces and piecing together exactly how large uh the situation is lyra did you want to have um did you want to comment on some of the strategies that have uh worked for you obviously you're starting some of these conversations on a year year to year basis given what you've said about your project funding yeah, yeah. Oh, I, <laughs> I'm writing notes, Penny. Like, this is awesome. I did start off bold. I kind of feel like, oh, my gosh, you're speaking about me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, yeah, the naivety is probably, you know, um, as long as you kind of, you know, approach it diplomatically and tactfully, um, you know, you can um, start some new things and, you um, be a little bit of a disruptor um, uh, for, for, a, for a good pilot. So um, I think I needed that definitely for, for impact. Um, and, you know, I, I agree with um, Penny, you do get that finesse the further that you go, um, the more knowledge you have of the organisation. Um, but certainly I can tell you just being in the public sector uh, for so long, hopefully you're not institutionalised as well and you keep you know, an idea of your identity and your work style and infuse that into uh, your program because it's your energy and your drive as well that, 
you know, those people that work around you or that you might cross paths with enjoy uh, because you are sometimes refreshing to other operational, um, you know, deliverables for the organisation. So sometimes you are a breath of fresh air depending on, you know, the, mm. the volunteer organisation type you are. Um, and, and, you know, on, on that note, once you kind of get further in the journey and you get a better, a deeper understanding and a working knowledge of the organisation um, that you're working for, of course, you know, you, you do map to their framework and practices and it can obviously, you know, uh, report your outcomes to, to other similar support service areas. Um, you know, my positioning of my program isn't, isn't like some that are with HR or organisational development, um, but, you know, I've, I've tried to do things like join the change management network and community of practice. So, you know, I, because of, of what I'm instilling uh, with the volunteer involving activities, they do instigate change in the learning and teaching areas. So, you know, um, any of those tools within the organisation that are, you know, are already adopted or used, especially from middle management upwards, are really good because, you know, they get attention already. So, you know, it's nice not to reinvent the wheel all the time. So, you know, I might be able to use like change impact tools to show a good risk to benefit ratio. Um, so I've, I've used that all the time, like Penny was saying, with, with risk. Um, so what can you use to just show, you know, you've got more benefit versus risk for something that you're wanting to undertake? So, yeah, definitely go and scour those tools and keep refreshing yourself on them um, because, yeah, you you try where you can if you're a small team to work smarter and not harder. Um, so that's probably, yeah, Penny, like, yeah, we should start a choir because you sing in songs that I'm really, yeah, <laughs> really into. Yeah, don't, don't always sing in Shane though. Like. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can work on that. That can be another offshoot, VV choir, uh, you know, we'll start a club. But meanwhile, we've talked a little bit about um, getting the timing right and I guess um, picking your moment. And so I guess I wanted to ask both of you, how has organisational change or that timing influenced your advocacy? And like Penny, you've talked a little bit about this, um, you know, but maybe you wanted to elaborate further on how some of the timing, you know, impacted some of the way or you know the level of your ask yeah sure absolutely timing is everything and the hardest thing about timing is you don't get to um, predict that at times although there are um, opportunities where something's happening and you can piggyback on it but I mean for me and when I first started obviously as I mentioned the uh, Royal Commission was uh, perfect timing to get the attention on something that hadn't been given attention um, and bringing some thinking and ideas that have never been considered. People don't know what they don't know. And so um, it does take, um, the you know, getting the timing right for them to be at that position to understand what they don't know, particularly if they're in more senior roles with, you know, lots of different um, pushes and pulls that they've got to attend to, to bring in something new that they have never considered about. It's a very uncomfortable thing. I mean, you think about it for us, when someone's bringing something to us when we're really super busy, and we think they should know, but they don't know. And how to get their attention is, is um, really challenging. And, and so timing is everything. Um, so it is looking for those signposts and those opportunities. I mean, they do, you know, you, there's this age old thing where you get in the elevator, what's your pitch? And that is timing potentially. Um, so it is having your messages ready to go. And, and also those messages for different types of people. So if you're in a um, yeah, whatever organisation is, you know, your operational person, your message would be very different to an operational pers um, person because they want they want things that make sense to them and their um, their operations um, versus someone in senior leadership who've got accountability for policy procedures and governance. Uh, um, so your your messaging does need to be different um, for those different audiences. The other timings is when you've got a new line manager and um, I stalked my um, now manager before she started. So, <laughs> and I got into a diary really quickly to give her a presentation and she hadn't come from a volunteer management background. So, you know, talk about don't know what you don't know. And, and that, you know, it's taken some time to bring her up to speed and not because she's um, 
not a clever woman because she is and she's very capable, but this is a whole new sphere for her in a very different organisation to what she's worked in beforehand. So, um, you know, getting in with a new line merge is really important. Um, and I guess, you know, those um, avenues that Lyra talked about is opportunities if there's different avenues for which to, to speak to um, different groups. Um, that that have opportunities available. Like I was just in a meeting today, and I was um, got some some stakeholders that are a bit challenging to get attention from. They're really not interested in this space, and yet they've got um, some accountability for it, but they're not really interested. So um, I actually asked, I, I actually did some um, questions to them to, and I, I made it safe for them. And um, and that they got engaged. And then at the end of the presentation, I said, I really would appreciate your feedback on this and how you think. We so it's about, you know, you know, using those opportunities to engage them in a way that makes them feel safe so they can contribute and, and um, become, as Lyra said, those sponsors or those um, supporters. The critical thing that I, I recruited this amazing gentleman, Clint Pacheo, when I first started at TSA because I really, really was very lonely and I thought, what the heck am I going to do? And um, he'd been a GM in lots of different um, sectors. Um, and he was my, you know, kind of a coach or a sounding board. Um, and I, I was a coach and sounding board for him because he was moving from the profit sector to the not-for-profit sector. And so we, we found a nice sweet spot there for each other. But um, he wrote, uh, he used to, he pulled out a card out of his jacket um, one day and he always wore a suit, it's kind of cute. Um, and he pulled it out and, and it's Neva's serenity prayer and it's really sustained me and it's, uh, I'll read it for you. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. And the wisdom, which is the hardest bit, the wisdom to know the difference. And that really does talk to timing and, and figuring out what the right time is to do um, when to speak. Absolutely, like timing is so critical. Lyra, did you have anything you wanted to um, add for timing in particular or? Well, yeah, <laughs> funny, uh, I've been part of kind of the health sector for quite some time and, and going into education, it's certainly a lot more volatile, I think, um, if, if I could use a stronger word, um, especially with funding and courses being cut dependent on enrolment. So, you know, that expanding and contracting of this sector was certainly um, something that I wasn't used to um, versus that stability of health. So, you know, from that point of view, um, you could feel that um, insecurity of everyone and then we kind of overlaid COVID with that as well. Um, so last year, I wasn't even a volunteer manager for six to eight months. I was, I was redeployed somewhere else uh, to be team leader. Um, and so it was like, you know, when you say get the timing right, it's not always your time and you're not always in control of that. So just right on what Penny's serenity prayer is, is, is that wisdom to go, oh, it's not my time, um, but what can I make of, of the timing of things um, and so, you know, where I was placed, it's like, well, how can I use, you know, my knowledge and skill set and look at it from a volunteer angle um, with these, uh, and I got forwarded to international students who were in quite high need at the time. Um, and yeah, we, we started something new, um, a volunteering initiative where it was peer to peer support. So, you know, um, some of the things you feel like you can plan but other things are unplanned and you can just see your window and you just got to jump through that window um, and have a little bit of boldness um, and a whole, a whole bunch of kind of hopefully preparation um, so that you can uh, take positive advantage of it. So, and my next one is, is a restructure. So um, <laughs> what Penny was saying about line management, I've, I've had about four changes in management in the last two odd years and, um, I've just got a, a new incoming uh, chief officer as well um, and I've changed reporting lines another two times so you know they're tectonic shifts and um, <laughs> I just keep adjusting um, and a lot of the timing's not on me but you know at the same time I'm like well what can I take out of this situation 
uh, that is my pace and time. Um, and some things match the organisation with their timing um, and their changes that they're making. And some of them I can just make micro changes for my timing. Um, and hopefully they synchronise somewhere in the middle <laughs> and I get some green ticks in the right places um, to make my management happy. So I suppose that's a little bit ambiguous um, saying that, but that's about the best that I can get it because, you know, timing's not always on your side. Uh, it's just seeing that there might be a right time to do something um, and that will present itself sometimes just situationally and you just got to take advantage. Absolutely. And I'm can I sorry. Just, can I jump in there um, just to um, just acknowledge, yeah, the agility that's needed, hey, um, it's, it's <laughs> pretty significant and similar to you, Leah. I've had seven different line managers in eight years mm. and I've moved roles four times. And um, But the way that I've sort of reframed that, you know, um, the, the plates moving, as you said, is uh, really think about, hey, these are new converts. I've got this opportunity to convert these guys. <laughs> <laughs> like volunteerism. I love it. Um, it's just a chance to educate and um and challenge and you know in a obviously a respectful way, but um it's certainly you know get a, cha a chance to reshape some thinking. Um and so that some ways more line managers can be beneficial, but not generally, generally it's not it breaks up continuity, but it certainly does present some new opportunities. Absolutely. So Moving on, I guess I wanted you guys to share a particularly impactful moment of advocacy or culture creation. And uh, this is your time for a little humble brag um, about something that has been a real woohoo for you guys particularly. Um, and just also to note, um, for those of you online, if you do have any questions for Lyra or Penny, um, we've got a couple more questions, but start popping them into the chat box if you would like. So Penny, did you want to talk about uh, big impactful win? Um, yeah, I've had the privilege of having a few, Sarah, and um, I feel like all the years prior were built for this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in 2014, moving from just myself to then building a small team um, was a really big step change for the Salvation Army um, and to be thinking uh, or even allowing for a bit of a strategic approach to the involvement of volunteers was a, a significant step change. It came with some real cultural challenges, which is to even, even to define who a volunteer was. And, and um, if anyone's got that problem, please reach out and happy to, um, to hear your story and provide some, perhaps some thoughts. But it was a really big challenge um, for the organisation. It continues to be as we've become nationalised. So my role was just um, in the southern states plus NT. Um, and then it expanded to a national role in 2018. And so in 2017 was also the next big step change where we became national. And my counterpart in um, New South Wales, Queensland, ACT and I worked really closely together. And, and some of you have heard this story. And it's just a beautiful synergy that volunteer management um, community have where it's, you know, you put your, your competitiveness aside and you just think, well, it's a greater good and let's work together and let's worry about, you know, what happens after, or who gets what after. Um, and it enabled us to lift the investment um, by 80%. And this is an environment where they were looking for cuts of 15% um, um, in the first year and 15% in the second year. So we were radically different to every other um, function within the Salvation Army where massive cuts had to be made. Um, and we were able to sell the story to get that increased resourcing. And so we, we went from... Um, Nine, nine team members around Australia to 16. Um, and, and I guess in the assessment of the roles too, they were more along the lines of our HR paid kind of role as well. So it was a really significant um, significant win that was going against the, the uh, intent of the restructure. <laughs> so yeah, that's the biggest brag, I think. Um, and we continue on as a team, like we're still... Um, retained the team. I think we've lost one team member. And so we've got a really steady, committed, incredibly talented group of people committed um, to serving the mission of the Salvation Army and the VR team. Um, so that's the other brag. I'm just really lucky to have incredibly talented people. And I know Laura, I saw your comment there and Laura will be able to test that. She's met many of the team members and she'll be able to tell you that they're pretty incredible people. Um, so that's my brag. 
<laughs> and look, it's a pretty good brag, but you know, for anyone else on the line, please don't be intimidated. Uh, it doesn't mean after listening to this webinar that you have to magically be able to double the resourcing of your team. <laughs> Um, that's, uh, I'm, I'm not going to claim that. Um, Lyra, <laughs> did you want to share a successful win story? <laughs> um, well, that's, I'm, um, yeah, I'm flawed. Amazing, Penny. Um, and it's, and it's great to have that team around you as well. Um, cause yeah, the, the success just keeps going. Um, and I, I'm certainly, you know, on a, on a state level as a TAFE provider and trying to run volunteer programs inside of it. I've kind of got a little pathway there. Um, and I don't know at the moment um, whether it's going to come become true, but certainly, you know, the programs are funded to kind of remove those barriers to education and employment. So, you know, I've put in, you know, hopefully some, some interns and maybe um, some part-time admin people. So, you know, some of those volunteers or, or recent graduates can, can turn into our employees and, and, and really put forth uh, what the program aim to do and see if I can make that a reality. So uh, that one's in the pipeline, but pretty much the, the easiest one for me is COVID and how it is absolutely, um, you know, thoroughly impacted the higher and further education sector. Um, it's really, it's really crippled the uh, opportunity for students to finish. And so on-site placements are still largely suspended. So I thought during this time, okay, um, online volunteering is increasing, especially with some of those sitting at home with JobKeeper and things. So, you know, with that redeployment I had for, for most of last year as well, I'm, I'm thinking this is the year that skilled volunteering is looking highly desirable as a supplementary placement source for our students yet to graduate. Um, and suddenly, yeah, I've got, I've got ears perked up and um, I'm certainly learning a lot more about <laughs> platforms and system developments than I, than I care to, to want to know. But um, I am, like Penny's saying, pivoting um, to where the trends are going. Um, so maybe if I, if I don't have that team, uh, maybe I can start with a virtual team um, and get the support from those education staff to provide online skilled volunteering as, as, our, as our new way forward. Fantastic. And so because we, we really couldn't um, be in a webinar these days without talking about the COVID factor, so while well, you've alluded to it um, uh, just a little bit Lira, um, I guess I'll ask you both how COVID-19 has really impacted on your advocacy, like uh, the strategies that you might have used, like, uh, or what opportunities you've had. And so Lyra, did you want to expand on anything further? Obviously that's um, given you the opportunity to uh, hook people's interest in a remote, uh, in a skilled volunteering uh, program, which is great. Mm. Yeah, I think, you know, what it's really highlighted as well is, um, and not only just professional staff with regards to their digital literacy, um, uh, but it's certainly for the for our volunteers as well, you know, um, how much um, are we digitally enabling them to be able to continue to volunteer um, if we want them either in a, in a pure virtual volunteering capacity or whether blended going forward, you know, a little bit of face-to-face -face on site as well as online, you know, are we supported with IT infrastructure for that? Um, do, we, do we have a, a place that um, our volunteers can go bring your own device BID and see if they've even got hardware that's compatible with all of our platforms. These are kind of new things that we, we'd never thought of because a lot of us have, you know, um, pe like service-based or people-based uh, services. So it's it's been tricky to go, how can we translate that into a digital environment going forward um, and see for those that are digitally curious, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, at the moment working in the government's uh, rolled out some funding for seniors and, you know, um, English's additional language um, to, you know, up their digital literacy. So, you know, I'm taking advantage of, of seeing, you know, what can we offer our volunteers in regards to um, trading online, just getting them signed up even. They're, they're just simple things, but, you know, if we, we don't provide the tools or the access to the tools, then how can we expect 
you know, online and virtual volunteering to actually expand. Um, even for those that are curious and want to take a toe dip, we, we have to make space for that. So that's probably the direction that I'm, I'm looking in because if I want to keep surviving this year um, in a COVID safe way, uh, depending on where the restrictions slide, um, I have to have uh, virtual volunteering as an absolute option. Well, absolutely. And as someone who's currently in an office with, you know, a mask on, um, that's changed as of 10 p.m. last night. So I think things are just going to continue to change and change back again. Penny, how has the COVID factor changed your approach to advocacy or um, how has it impacted this year? Yeah, I mean, it had a big impact um, and it's hard to measure that because we have just moved on to a national online system for volunteer data just as October last year. And so the stability of this data of volunteers prior to that was a bit shaky. Um, so, but I'm estimating that we probably 20 to 25% of volunteer drop off last year. Um, so there's that. So how do we engage them? And we certainly developed lots of resources and supports because that's our role um, is to build the capabilities and managers to retain. Um, not we don't do the doing with the volunteers because it's um, you know so it's it's a, a volunteer base of around thirty thousand. So when I when I say I've got a built team of sixteen, just just consider that in light of the numbers. So. It's a, it's a brag, but still not like a fat team as far as the, <laughs> the size of the cohort in which we're um, um, supporting. Um, but one of the things that it has, and it is an advocacy opportunity, one is the, what the estimated drop-off is. So that's a point of advocacy because we've got to regain those volunteers. The second one, which is really significant, and, and Lyra, you talked about, you know, system access and and compatibility of systems and one of the things that is one of our challenges is currently um, TSA volunteers don't have access to systems unless they're in specific roles and it's only a handful of roles and mm. so that equity uh, equity of access is really um, something that we've been trying to um, advocate for and change um, in light of new systems and um, programs. So it's actually given us an opportunity to advocate even more because it becomes more evident that volunteers need to have that access, particularly if we want to expand in, in the digital space, which we do, um, and virtual space. So, um, so that's what has profited, I guess, um, but it's still inequitable as far as um, access um, well, absolutely. And <laughs> I don't think a journey's ever done. And I think, you know, I often use this year about um, just how quickly everybody had to pivot. And, you know, we had some amazing innovation and, you know, really moved heaven and earth as a sector to keep volunteer programs running. You know, the state of volunteering uh, data that we collected showed that volunteering jumped from 16 to 44% of people who volunteered online, which just so shows how quickly organisations were working during that initial first lockdown to get people online. But there's so many, you know, uh, unknowns that we're discovering now as systems are solidifying. So, again, I'd encourage anyone who has any questions, please do. Otherwise, my last question to you both today, and thank you for sharing your thoughts and wisdom, is just advice to anyone else who may be facing the same challenge. I think, um, you know, coming out of last year, there was definitely some exhaustion. And when you've been at an organisation feeling like you're knocking down similar doors, um, you can often sometimes feel like, oh, where to from here? So any advice? And I'll start with you, Penny. Um, where to from here? I guess it's going back to why you're doing what you're doing because that's um, obviously critical for you to continue on and, um, you know, question question that first of all. You know, is it is it... Um, are you feeling like you can make a difference? Is the organisation feeling... Um, it, it, uh, it's a little formula that Klim actually gave me and I must, I must um, send it to you, Sarah, but it, it's a basically a way of assessing whether you're in the right role at the right time to the benefit of the organisation and, um, and co-beneficial. So I will send it to you, Sarah. I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head, <laughs> but I think that's where it starts is understanding, you know, it, um, are you feeling like you can advocate and make a difference or not? And if not, then 
and, and it's not sort of ticking your mission or drives, then perhaps um, consider, reconsider. <laughs> Um, but for me, I, I look at um, I, I look to people who are like minded and understand the value and contribution of volunteers. Um, and I remind myself of those people that we're serving. You know, our clients, our you know people who need assistance. And I think about the people who are doing that and the hard yards they're doing. Um, you know, I do I do align with our mission and values, so it really does drive me. Um, and I guess one of the things that when things get the most difficult and, and it hasn't been an easy journey by any, any sorts is I just think to bring about change in any community on anything takes considerable energy and commitment. Um, and there's people, you know, that we can point to in our communities or broader that have just paid an enormous price to bring about change. And I'm thinking I'm doing something minute compar compared to some of those guys, you know. <laughs> And, and they did it, so I can draw strength from them. So that's just some of the things that I, I think on Ponder, Sarah. Fantastic, Lyra, any advice? And then we have a question. Um, so I'll throw to you both there, but Lyra? Yeah, I'm- General I'm, advice. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely loving what um, Penny's saying, obviously about that energy and drive and, you know, from COVID last year, and I'm sure some of us uh, worked pretty intensively, if not all of us, um, is that self-care? Um, it really, you know, it would be remiss of me not to kind of mention um, mentors as well. It's, it's, it's definitely my lane as well. But, you know, even if you have a chance to start or curate your own personal advisory board, because you have to work this long game, it can get a little bit battle weary, repeating yourself and not feeling like you're always being heard. Um, and, you know, following this revert to all of our pennies and my previous points you had long time frames more patience <laughs> but um the probably the last the last one if you're a glass half full type of person um I was thinking about this last night and we think you know we took for granted little things like being able to get together to celebrate things right so like your birthday or something like that and I thought about it gee my birthday only happens once a year and time just goes past and I don't have to do anything for it I just got older and somehow it's a celebration. But you think of all of the things that you do, that, that energy and drive that Penny was saying, all the people that you've collaborated with, um, the repetition, the self-advocacy, just, you know, feeling like it's, it can be sometimes a relentless wheel. But you don't stop and celebrate the small successes or the major milestones with anyone. And I just think that's just as important as putting in all our marketing and comms and campaigns into our calendars is to mark that in your calendar. Like, yeah, I'm going to hit this milestone and I'm going to invite a few people to celebrate with um, because that's kind of how you feel like there's a sense of achievement and satisfaction and job fulfilment as opposed to just, you know, continuous self-advocacy um, without feeling like you've arrived. You know, like there's an end point to advocating and you've, you can achieve that. Um, and it's not one big thing, it's just a bunch of small successes and having people on your side um, to celebrate with you and get you, um, I think that that's, that's something we've got to do more of. Yeah, I can't agree more, Lyra. As satisfying as, like, uh, crossing out an item on the to-do list is, there's always another one that replaces it. So making sure that you celebrate in ways that are bigger than just taking a pencil and striking through that uh, kind of to-do list, I think it's important. Now, Kate's asked um, uh, and said, thanks, uh, but how would you be suggest beginning the conversation about recruitment and record management of volunteers sitting with HR? So Penny, did you wanna talk about that? Yeah, it's a question is whether the function should sit within HR or I'm not too sure the what Kate, um, Kate you mean. Kate, you might want to clarify a little bit, um, but just um, uh, possibly that HR currently has control of the process. I don't know if you want to type, type in your answer uh, further, Kate, um, but, you know, how would you, I guess, approach starting that conversation with HR? Um, so I think the, is the intent... So, so it's, not, it's currently, not currently with HR. Okay. And you want it to be, Kate? Okay. 
I just don't want to answer a question wrongly. <laughs> I mean, I... That's okay. I think it, it would, um, my assumption now uh, is that um, Kate would be looking to move that into HR. Okay, so if you want it to, um, it, it's the good old with them, what's in it for me scenario. So what's in it for HR to um, have volunteer records and management in HR? What would they give? It would give them visibility of the whole workforce. It would give them visibility of um, workforce planning. So depending on size, size of your organisation, you know, what's the, the way of looking at what the resources are needed for the function and, and what are the um, benefits of having visibility of that and planning um, with HR, which is significant, I would think, because then it also helps them think about their resourcing and um, FTE count and budget. Um, so it gives them a visibility of that. Um, it means that they can have a surety uh, visibility of compliance and compliance requirements um, that need for the function as well. So are they getting ticked off and they can see whether they are or aren't if they've got that sort of um, visibility. But there's some things just off the top of my head. Vera, did you have any thoughts about, uh, you know, trying to engage HR in, I guess, uh, engaging further in the recruitment and record management of volunteers, like to, to give them that sort of ownership to, I guess, include volunteers as part of the larger workforce? I'm nodding. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it certainly um, can be a challenge um, if if volunteers aren't really that considered and it's just from uh, a risk averse perspective of going, okay, just as long as they don't kind of contravene the Fair Work Act, I'll cast my eye over that. Um, and it depends on the size, I think, that um, of, of um, you know, records management that you're asking um, and whether you feel like the security and privacy um, that HR have in regards to those um, records uh, far surpasses what you can offer as well uh, for your best practice for volunteer records and, and data privacy, you know, you could err to, you know, IT and data security as well, because, you know, we're talking COVID and the digitization of things, and there's certainly been a tightening on data security. Um, so, you know, I'm definitely leaning towards involving both IT and HR and then revisiting um, that exact uh, question. So, yeah, um, I, I would love to know um, how you progress with that, but that's certainly my approach at the moment. Well, we might have to connect afterwards and, and share approaches, but I think certainly um, that what's in it for me is a really good mantra of just sitting and, and trying to get into the perspective of an HR team or a team you're looking to influence um, and really kind of calling on some of those levers that um, Penny and Lyra have uh, kind of alluded to, uh, <laughs> particularly risk, particularly compliance data security. Any other questions before we uh, finish off uh, for the time being? Looks like we might be good. So we're basically bang on the hour. So thank you all so much for your attendance today. I hope this has been an inspirational conversation to start the year where I think we'll all be flying our own flag quite a bit more. Um, I'd like to really thank uh, Penny and Lyra for their time today, for being willing to be first up in our calendar of webinars, but also sharing such great insights and wisdom about, um, you know, their journeys at their organisations thus far. So thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thanks, guys. Thanks, all. Thanks, Matt. Bye. Bye.